Well, remain standing, and let's look over at Exodus chapter 20, and if you would, we're going to look at verse 14. While you're turning there, uh, while he was talking about the folks up in Alaska taking off and the door swinging open, we had Brother Vineyard in a plane up in Wyoming, and it was in the middle of the winter, and we had just got loaded in, and we were getting to take off, and we head down the runway, and all of a sudden, the pilot said, we got a problem. The baggage door came open, and Brother Vineyard's luggage came out, and his clothes went everywhere. Oh my. <laughs> it was about 25 below zero, and guess who got to pick them up? Amen? <laughs> but it was that prop, too, because it's blowing all the air back. Those clothes just went everywhere. It was hilarious. But anyhow, all right, Exodus 20 and verse 14, another just short. Cons what's, is it not on? All right, we on now? Uh -huh. We're on now. Oh, right. All right. Exodus 20 and verse 14. It says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Father, again tonight, we're thankful for a midweek service. Mm -hmm. And we do pray that you would bless tonight as we look at this very, very serious and destructive power. Mm -hmm. And Father, I ask you tonight, if there be a lost in our midst, that they would be saved. And for those that maybe are struggling with their walk with you tonight, they draw closer than ever before. And we're going to thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. It's, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I entitled the message, A Very Destructive Power. And by the way, it is a destructive power. Uh, you think of what's happened over the years and the decades and the eons because of adultery, and it's never, ever good. Uh, God created man with many abilities, and I think about this. Uh, he gave us ability to hear. That's pretty good. Amen? Uh, my wife needs hearing aids. Pray for her. Amen. She doesn't hear as good as she used to. But he gives us the ability to hear. I think about the ability to see. The eyes are an amazing uh, something that God has given man. We have the ability to speak. We have the ability to smell, the ability to think, the ability to walk. We have so many things that God has given us. But listen, one of the most marvelous of all is this, the ability to reproduce ourselves. And that's exactly what God has given. It was a gift from heaven. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, it says this, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and what? Multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Phys the physical act of reproduction is a gift from God. And I'm going to tell you, this can really, some people take this and I think abuse this, use language that should not be used. I don't believe in that. But I believe it's something that needs to be taught and it's something that needs to be understood. I think how God gave it to man and his wife for procreation, that's to reproduce and have offsprings, but he also gave it for pleasure, and that's a fact. The physical desire between a man and a woman uh, is natural. It's a natural thing. That also God gave. Uh, it's not bad, but here's what's happened. Over the centuries, what God intended for good has become a very corrupted thing because of sin. Now, it's going to get real quiet in here tonight. We're going to look at a lot of different aspects of this. But I want you to think about it. God gave this as something as a gift to man and woman, to husband and wife. Now, I want to give you a definition of sin. Sin is a voluntary departure from a known rule, duty, or divine command from God. That's exactly what sin is. If we know what this book says, and God wants us to do it, and we don't do it, what is it? It's sin. Uh, yeah, come on, don't get quiet on me tonight. Amen. I need help. Lots of it. But to express, and I want you to think of this, we, we often think of adultery as the act itself. But here's the thing. To express physical desire to anyone outside your marriage relationship is sin. Amen. Amen. If it's not your spouse, you have no business having any kind of physical desire whether it's a man or whether it's a woman. And the entire scope of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14 is much broader than just unfaithfulness in a marriage relationship. So we're going to look at different things tonight. It also includes fornication. You say, what is fornication? Well, it's the Greek word pornea, where we get what word do you think comes from that? Pornography or porn. And what that means, it means harlotry includes adultery and incest. That all goes together under this heading. Now, the definition of fornication is any unscriptural intimate relationship. 
That's fornication. Webster's 1828 also says this. It's the lack of self-control or lewdness of unmarried persons, male or female, also the criminal conversation between a married man and an unmarried woman. Or you could switch that around, the woman and the man. Any type of intimate expression outside the marriage relationship is sin. And our world doesn't see that today. I mean, what goes on in our world today and this day and age is an abomination to God. And it's not just out in the lost world, it's even in the church. And it's not right. Uh, Here's the physical enticements. And I mean, they are absolutely everywhere. Television. Uh, I'm thankful tonight we have a TV, but we only have uh, things that we can either put in a, a DVD or that we may get. And we're very careful about what we watch. You, you say, well, but it, it's not that serious. Listen, if you'll let the little tiny cuss words come into your house, it won't be long. You'll let the other ones come in, and next thing you know, you'll let anything and everything come in. TV is something that's terrible, and it's worse today. The, the ads on television today, many of them are worse than, than things used to be R-rated years ago. They are. I think about magazines, movies. Uh, I am very careful when, when somebody said, I have a movie that I want you to watch. Uh, you say, why are you very careful about that? Because uh, most of the time it has something in it that I wouldn't want to see. And it's even in a Christian home, it's like that. But then also, uh, billboards. I think also of modest dress, immodest dress on men and women both. These are things that entice the, this thing we call adultery. And also social media. I mean, the social media is one of the worst offenders of it is all. Amen. So, uh, you go to the mall today. That's a good place to go and look. Go to the mall, go to Walmart, and you see a world that is, is obsessed with the physical, whether it be in their dress, whether it be in their actions, or whether it be in the way they talk. They conduct themselves. Now, look at John chapter 8 and look at verse 1 through 5. Adultery isn't something new. It's not. In John chapter 8 and verse 1, down through verse number 5, it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Now that was all the way back in Jesus' time. I mean, it's nothing new. It's not. Here's a a recent statistic. 21% of married men admit to adultery. 21%, that's a bunch. Uh, 13% of married women uh, admit to adultery. 21 and 31, everybody's real quiet in here tonight. Do you know this is something we need to know about? Amen. Amen. And it's something that, that we need to put in the right context and not do it in a lustful way the world would do it. Amen. Uh, Here's another one. This one blew my mind when I saw it. And this says of a thousand subscribers to a Christian magazine. Now, quote, who knows what that means, Christian. Amen. Uh, There's a lot of things people call Christian. But listen to the statistic there. 45% said they had acted inappropriately. 23% admitted to committing adultery. That is in a Christian periodical. Okay. That's not the world. That's in what we would call Christendom. And, and so here's what I thought. Uh, adults involved in adultery are saying something to our young people. What are they saying to the younger generations? It's okay. It's all right. Uh, but you know what God still calls it? He still calls it sin. There's no doubt about it. And as a result, you think about how because of the lax morals, it's estimated that one out of every five, five Uh, young people, teenagers, between the age of 13 and 60, lose their virginity. 13 to 16. That's one out of five. Now, we were in Ohio. This has been some years ago. I never forgot it. The pastor had just come in, and he had only been there a short time. And when we got there, he said almost every girl that was in the youth department prior to his coming had to get married. That was an independent, fundamental Baptist church. A rural little church. Uh, Listen, I think sometimes we have our heads stuck in the sand and we don't realize the seriousness of this this particular issue. And it's no wonder there's AIDS. There's no wonder there's every kind of social disease. There's no wonder why there's so many abortions and people are wanting abortions and also teens caring about 
babies that are not married. And you know where the example comes from? It comes from the adults. And it's not right. Now, I want to look at several things tonight in regards to this thing of adultery and its destructive power and its sin and who that sin is against. Number one, I want you to see it's sin against your spouse if you're married. Adultery has the power to break a union that was meant to last for how long? forever what does the bible said it says a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what one flesh and also here's another one and this is a tragic one and this happens and you see people that have been married and they're no longer married and one or the other is in a depressed state here's what adultery does it, it has the power to destroy the self-esteem of the person that was left or was cheated upon and here's what they say I wasn't good enough. I wasn't a good enough mate, and that's why they've done this. And it throws a guilt trip. And who do you think's behind that? Yeah. It's the devil. Amen. And here's the other one. Adultery has the power to destroy trust. I don't know about you, but in a marriage, trust is one of the most important things you have. Six. And I want you to look at chapter 6 and verse 18 to verse 20. And then we're going to look at the verse part of chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. You get there, say amen. amen. That's three of you. Okay. Remember, just open your Bible and turn, and if you can't find it, just open and act like you got it. Amen. But look there at verse number 18. What's the very first word in that thing, that verse? It says, flee what? Fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the what? Now look at this. The temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. You know, I've said this all the time in Sunday school. You and I that are saved, whatever we do, the Holy Spirit's always there. He hears, he sees, he is present. Amen. And then look at verse number 20. For ye are bought with a price, therefore what? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I wonder uh, who in the world would, would think that adultery glorifies God. How in the world can anybody that's really saved, born into the family of God, a child of God, how can they think that adultery would be acceptable to God? And I don't care the circumstance. It's not acceptable unto God. Now, look over at the next chapter and look at verse number 1 of chapter 7. Now, I believe this is how you... You adultery proof your marriage. This is one way. It says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to what? You know what that's talking about? If you're not married, you ought not touch. Amen. And I've said that to couples during counseling, and you know what? They don't want to counsel anymore. They don't, this is 2024, and things are different today. No, that verse still means what it says. If you've got flesh and blood and you're, you're alive and blood's through, through your veins, you cannot touch the opposite gender and expect things to go right. It, do, it doesn't work. You say, but we've done it and it's okay. Well, you were very fortunate. Right. Amen. Now, look at verse number two. It says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, that's the relationship between unmarried it says, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. That word benevolence means, uh, the word, I can't get it out, marital responsibility. Okay? And that's in the intimate area. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud you not one another, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. That Look at the next part. And who is the tempter? That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Okay, so that word render means the discharge of an obligation. We all have a responsibility to our mate. We do. We need to render due benevolent. That means the marital responsibility we have. And that word defraud, it means this, to deprive or rob. You know what some people do? They will use the intimate part of a marriage relationship as a tool or a weapon against their mate. And that's not right. That's not what God gave it for. And so we need to be very careful. God, God's way is always right, and it always works. Amen. Amen. 
But not only is it sin against your mate, but here's the second one. Adultery is very destructive power, and it's sin against your children. You say against children. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, and look at verses 2 through 5. And this is talking about David. When David went out in the evening tide, and went up on the roof, and he looked down off his roof, and he saw Bathsheba, and he lusted after her, but he didn't leave it at that. He actually called her unto himself. And look at what it says. It says, And it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. A lot of people blame Bathsheba. But you know, as I read, read about this, many of the wealthier people didn't have just one house. They would have a house, and it was like a U-shape with a courtyard, and their house went around it. Well, David had an advantage. He was up above. Bathsheba could have very well been in the province, her own place, and she was taking a bath, and David just happened to be at a vantage point where he could see her. But it doesn't change the fact of what he did. And then it goes on, and David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uri the Hittite? Man, it was one of his soldiers. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, what was the result of that adulterous affair? There were, there were results. Uh, David's fellowship with God was what? Broken. I mean, you're not going to tell me that somebody's out and they're involved in a, an adulterous relationship or involved in fornication, that they have a relationship with God. They don't. And then also, David had Bathsheba's husband put to death. A man was killed because of an adulterous affair. Uh, they had a baby. The baby was, it wasn't right. It was a, a baby out of, of, of an adulterous affair. It was wrong. And then we see that Amnon raped his sister Tamar. Absalom killed Amnon. Absalom tried to take the kingdom. Absalom took David's concubines, and then Absalom himself was killed. You say, do you think that stems all the way back to David? I believe so. Yeah. David's sin was costing him a great deal, and it was against his children. And I think when a parent is involved in adultery, their children lose respect for, number one, the parents. They lose respect for the word of God that the parents say they believe. And then they also lose respect for what is right. I wonder how many young people, and maybe even some sitting here tonight, you've seen something go on in, in your family, and as a result of that, you lost respect, you didn't want to do right, and you just said, if they can do it, I do it too. And that's not the attitude we should have. But also, not only is adultery destructive power and sin against your spouse and your children, but it's against yourself. Right. It is against yourself. Adultery in a believer's life is a result of being backslidden. Bottom line. Right. How, how can you answer it any other way? If somebody that knows the word of God and has walked with God but then falls into that sin, that means that they have backed up on what the Bible says. In fact, let me give you the definition of backslidden. It means abandonment or to forsake the principles of God. This book is a book of precepts and principles. Amen. Amen. And you and I that are saved, we say we love the Lord and we need to obey this book. And when we get backslidden, we're saying, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. And that's what leads to this sin. If not confessed and forsaken, guess what the sin does? It magnifies. And not only does it get magnified, but it also is much easier to get involved in. It is. Man, I got away with it this last time. Nothing happened. I'm going to do it again. Amen. But secondly, adultery is not just the physical act. Look at that Matthew 5 and look at verse 28. It's also mental. It's not only the physical act, but it's also a mental situation. In Matthew 5 and verse number 28, the scripture very clearly states it. It says, but I say unto you, that whosoever, what's the next word? Looketh. What's that word? Looketh. Looketh on a woman to lust after her hath what? Committed. Committed adultery with her already in his heart. And you know, there's so many things today that promote that kind of a mentality. I think about immodest dress. Do you know why Christian ladies ought to dress right? You ought, you ought to dress in a way that it glorifies God and it doesn't look like the world. 
Amen? Because you don't realize you walk down the street or you're in a store and if you're dressed immodestly or you're wearing tight clothing, you don't have any idea what some man might be doing. You may be causing a man to lust. And see, today everybody says, well, that's not a real big deal. That is a big deal. It's a real big deal. Because if we're causing somebody else to fall into sin, don't you think we have a part in that? Amen. I think about this also, boy and girl watching. When I lived in Wyoming, I I flew Falcons, and a guy that was a Falconry partner of mine, and he was saved. I have no question that he was saved. He had to go one day to the YMCA to tell his wife he wasn't going to be home for supper. We were going out hunting. And I remember I walked in with him, and we're walking down the halls, and all of a sudden he stopped, and he's looking in this door. I said, Howard, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking at God's creation. And it was a bunch of women in there in their tutus, and they were doing exercises. I said, what in the world are you doing? Oh, he said, come on, brother. Well, it wasn't a come on, brother to me. I thought it was wrong. I mean, there he is looking at these women that were scantily clad, and and what in the world does he think is going to happen? Be normal. (laughs) That's like one time Brother Vineyard was preaching on pornography, and he said, you know, your Henry says that pornography doesn't affect him. It's okay. And this woman right in front of my wife, and I went, hit her husband. His name was Henry. (laughs) You'll get that in a minute. (sighs) Uh, Magazines, porn magazines, amen. Uh, Racy romance books. What about uh, your TV, movies, the things you bring into your home? Also, I think about the social networking today. I don't do Facebook. I don't know a whole lot about that, but I understand that on Facebook, you can see and and, and experience about anything you can imagine. You need to stay away from that stuff. But Christians feel like they're invincible. I can do this. I can look at it. It's not going to affect me. No, it will affect you. Look at Proverbs 6 and verse 26 through 32. Also, adultery has a price to self that is very great. What it costs the individual. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 26 through 32. It describes this whorish woman. It says, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? There ahead, you say, I can do this and it's not going to bother me. Go ahead and get you a bunch of fire, put it in your lap and see what the result is. Right. Same thing with adultery. Amen. It says, can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his what? Own soul. You may truly be saved, but I want to tell you, you could be permanently scarred as a result of adultery in your life. When I pastored, I had two different families, and it was, it was tragic. These were families that had small children, and the men were basically deadbeat guys. They really were. They stayed home. They did the wrong things. They went to the wrong places. If they weren't working in the job they wanted, they'd stay at home and make the wife go out to work. Both of those families ended up on web romances on the Internet chat sites. You've got to stay away from it. You can't even let yourself be exposed to it. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7. And not only does it affect yourself, but it also destroys your testimony. Right. I mean, it'll destroy a testimony. Listen, how long does it take to, de- to develop a testimony? A lifetime. How long does it take to destroy it? Just one second. Look here at 2 Samuel 12 and verse number 7, down through verse 14. And again, this is about David. It says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. And he was talking about the deal with Bathsheba. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and Judah and of Judah. And if that had not been too little, I would more have given unto thee such and such things. 
Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Thou hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. By the way, he got the enemy involved in murder. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. And who was that? That was his own son that did that. And it says, For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it, by thy, this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemy of the Lord. Who's the enemy of the Lord? The devil. Boy, he's given great occasion to the devil to blaspheme, and the children also, the child that also that is born to you shall surely what? Die. David's sin marred his testimony. And it, it, from that day to this very present day, God used David, but I don't think he used him like he would have used him if he had not fallen into that sin of adultery. Look at Job chapter 31 and verse 1. On the other hand, you know what? Job was somebody that was, was very wise because he took precautions that would glorify God and keep him from falling into sin. And, and I love this in Job 31.1. He said he made a covenant, didn't he? Yep. What was the covenant? He said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Well, I'll tell you what. Job's attitude kept him pure before the Lord Jesus. Amen? And I think that we all need to have an attitude that's saying, I'm going to do everything in my power to prevent myself from falling victim to lust or adultery, whether it be mental or physical adultery, whatever it is. And then look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Here's another good standard to live by in, or, in order to keep our minds and our thoughts what they should be, to keep away from this terrible sin. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are what? True. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report and look at this if there be any virtue and if there be any praise think on these things what what was the thing that david made the statement over in psalm 119 and verse 11 he said thy what thy word have i hid in my heart that i might not sin against thee you know when something in the temptation will come temptation comes to all of us but temptation is not sin. Right. It's when we fall to the temptation that we go into sin. So what do we do when the temptation comes? We ought to quote scripture. We ought to think on the things just like we saw in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. That it takes our mind away from the thoughts that are wrong. Amen. Right. And it, what goes in the eyes and in the heart and the mind, you mark it down. Good will come out if good goes in. And we need to realize that. Luke 6, 45 says... A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth what? Speaketh. You know, I'm not angry tonight with anybody but the devil. The devil has destroyed how many wonderful Christians, how many preachers over the years because of adultery have fallen and now we're no longer being used of God. And why is it? It's because we fall to the temptation of smutty face. Right. That's a bottom line. Husbands and wives, I think the above things are things that you can do that would really help to keep your marriage adultery free. But here's another. Adultery is a very destructive power because it's sin against society. It is. It's against our society. Look what's going on today. Why do you think the liberals are in control? Because adultery and fornication has run rampant in our country. We have single parents and we have uh, dysfunctional families. And you know who they're dependent upon? They're dependent upon the government. So the liberals will do everything in their power to give those that have nothing or they've lived a life that's full of sin everything they want and they stay in office. Amen. 
Ancient societies have fallen because of immorality. What about Sodom? What about Gomorrah? What about Rome? Amen. Amen. All of those. And, and again, look at the mess we're at here in America. God, give, give Christ the preeminence in your home. Give him the preeminence in your life in every area. Not when you say, well, I'll give him this and I'll give him that. No, I'm saying give him everything. Look at there at Colossians 1.18. Let me read this for you. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now notice this. It says that in, there's that little word. What is it? All things that he might have the preeminence. I mean, he's above everything. Amen. Nothing Amen. takes his place. I think maybe tonight we all need to make a covenant with God to remove those things that are in our lives, that are in our homes, that would cause us to fall to this terrible devastating sin and it can happen to anybody you say it never happened to me i wonder how many people have said that in the past yeah. amen but here adultery is a very destructive power not only to spouse children self and our society but it is to our savior and i think it's probably the greatest reason we should stay away from it but it's the one that's probably least considered who does it hurt it hurts the lord look at genesis chapter 39 and look at 7 through 9, and this is talking about Joseph. Joseph was somebody that loved the Lord, and his life, I believe, was one of, the, one of the greatest examples that anybody could have second to the Lord Jesus. Joseph went through a lot, a lot of temptations, a lot was thrown in his face. But I'll tell you what, Joseph walked with God. Look there at chapter 39, and we know that he was in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife was a wicked woman. In chapter 39 and verse 7, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, Lie with me. That woman was looking for trouble. She wanted to cause that young man to get into a, an affair that was not right. And then it goes on, But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. And there is nothing... There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything thing from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Look at this last part of this. It wasn't because of Potiphar, but it says, How then can I do this great wickedness and what? Sin against God. Amen. Young people that are unmarried, fornication, it's something very common today, but it is not in God's plan for Christian life. It's not. And I think that without a doubt that young people and adults, they need to realize that when they get involved in adultery or fornication, that it's against God, number one, above everybody else. And I think also how adultery destroys the marriage relationship, which pictures Christ in the church. It says, uh, oh boy, the verse, help me here, preacher. As Christ loved the church and what? Gave him. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself Amen. for it. Hey, when adultery and fornication are going on, it's a picture making a wrong picture and a statement to the world. It's not what God wants it to be. This is a hard topic. I hope you understand that. But I think it's a very needed topic that people need to understand that there are many ways that people can get involved in adultery and fornication Adultery is a, a destructive power, and what else can we do? I think here's some other things. Number one, walk with God daily. Don't, don't just walk with God on Sunday. Don't just walk with him on Wednesday, Sunday morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way through the week. Walk with God. Read your Bible. Pray. Stay, stay close to the Lord. Love God first above everybody except your mate. Your mate comes second. God comes first. Uh, avoid unhealthy situations. Amen. Amen. And you know what an unhealthy situation is. Right. God puts that in your mind. You can see something that's before you say, that's not good. You better follow the Holy Spirit's leadership and not go through with anything. And then also, how many of you ever had anybody flirt with you? Amen. <laughs> Liars. Everybody somewhere along the line has. Hey, Run. What did Joseph do? Joseph ran. He not only ran, but he left his coat behind him. Amen. And count the cost of what's going to happen if you do fall to the temptation. So what to do? 
if you've already broken the seventh commandment, whether it be mental or physical adultery, 1 John 1, 9 is still in the Bible. Amen. If we what? Confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the key to that is don't go back, whether it's physical or mental. But then what about spiritual adultery? Hey, you say, wow, I never thought you'd get to that. What is spiritual adultery? That's where we put more stock in something or somebody more than we put it in our Lord. Amen. Might be your job. It might be money. It might be some activity you do. But boy, I'll tell you what, that's spiritual adultery. Look what it says in James 4.4. 4. It says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, that is really strong terms. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I don't know what there is. If you're not in the hospital, you're not dead or you're not working, what should keep people from church? Is it a boat? Is it family? There shouldn't be anything that should come between us and our service to God. Because when we do that, that is called spiritual adultery. We're, we're putting our eggs in the basket somewhere else that belong to God. Amen. Amen. And how do you take care of that? Well, again, it's confess and forsake it. And you know what? We need to do whatever it takes is the bottom line. To abstain from adultery, fornication, whether it be physical, whether it be mental, and I know that's a hard pill to swaddle, and I know there's, there's probably people in here that have gone through uh, situations in your life that are very unpleasant, but you know what? That's in the past. You can't change what's in the past, but you can make a difference today and in the future. And we need to purpose in our hearts that we're going to do whatever God wants us to do, that we can maintain our relationship with God and our walk with God, and that nothing's going to disturb that or interrupt it. Don't let people influence you. Don't let people talk you into doing something you know that the Bible would not want you to do. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads, please. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight. I wonder if there might be one in this auditorium tonight, just one, that would say, if I died right now, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I know this, I don't want to go to hell. Anybody like that tonight? Anybody at all? I wonder how many tonight you'd say, the Lord spoke to my heart. It may not be physical adultery. It may not be physical fornication, but maybe it's a mental thing. Maybe it's the spiritual adultery where you're putting, you're putting more into something or somebody than you're putting into your Savior. I wonder tonight if there might be one to say, Lord just spoke to me tonight. There's some things I need to deal with. And just remember me when you close in prayer. Anybody like that tonight? You'd slip a hand up, just pop it up high. Amen, slowly. Father, you know the hearts. Thank you for those that were honest enough to raise a hand. I know this is a difficult subject, but it's a very serious subject. It's very devastating. It's very powerful to destroy. And I pray tonight, Father, we take this very seriously, whatever situation might be, that we would avoid it at all costs. And, Lord, that we would put you preeminent in our personal lives, in our families, our homes. And, Lord, that we'd have a desire only to glorify you. Bless the invitation tonight, Lord, please. And we'll give you all the praise. For we